When I was about 15 years old, my father took me to discover black holes. He took me to a public lecture by Chandra Shekhar, the great astrophysicist and Nobel laureate. And the lecture made a strong impression on me. I still remember two things about that talk. First, that Chandra Shekhar spoke with exceptional eloquence and great clarity. And second, that I didn't understand a word of his talk. In the years since, physics has made great progress. But one thing has remained constant. We still do not truly understand black holes. And that's a shame, because black holes, you see, are the key to unlocking the deepest origins of space and time. So today, I would like to tell you a story. It is a story of a puzzle the notorious black hole information puzzle. And well, this puzzle is regarded by many physicists as among the most important theoretical problems in physics, and is a puzzle closely related to the question of how to escape from a black hole. But I have to warn you that my story has no ending, because you see, the puzzle itself remains unsolved. So among all the sweeping claims in physics, there is one which is particularly striking. The past determines the future. What physics says is that not only does the past determine the future, but it does so uniquely. Every distinct past corresponds to a distinct future. If you change the past ever so slightly, you will change the future. So one past, one future, different past, different future. Or if you like to think of the universe as a giant computer, then input, output. This matching of past with the future is what g gives physics its great power. Because using observations about uh, using knowledge of the past, or of the present for that matter, we can make predictions. For example, using observations made today, we can predict with great accuracy the height of the tide at noon tomorrow, or the time of sunrise on New Year's Day in the year 3016, or even the fate of the universe itself. The mathematician Laplace put it very nicely, he said, if you knew everything about the present, then nothing would be uncertain. And the future, like the past, would be present before your eyes. Do you really believe you had a choice coming to this talk? Your presence here was determined before you were even born. It's important to recognize that this Trust in this predictability of physics underlies all our use of technology. For example, we drive our cars, we microwave our food, we board our airplanes, we do all this and more with great confidence because we know that if we press this button, we'll get that output, that result, input, output. So, well, what, is, what do black holes have to do with all this? Well, before we get into that, I would like to tell you a little bit about what a black hole actually is. In the popular imagination, black holes loom as some sinister objects lurking in the deep of space. Uh, they're kind of like the great white sharks of space, um, eating everything. Um, but for all their terror and mystery, the basic essential idea behind black holes is fairly simple to understand. If you throw something up, it comes back down. That's gravity. If you throw something up faster, I probably shouldn't do that with this laser pointer, um, it'll go up higher before coming back down. But if you throw something up really fast, it won't come back down at all. At that speed, it'll escape the gravitational pull of the object of the Earth, in this case. That speed is known as the escape velocity. And for the Earth, it's about uh, 40,000 kilometers per hour, 
That's uh, 11 kilometers per second, uh, roughly the speed of Superman. Uh, so if you throw a, fire a rocket at that speed and you go up, uh, then the Earth's gravity is not strong enough to pull you back down. Okay. Right, so what is a black hole? Well, a black hole is then simply an object whose gravitational pull is so strong that its escape velocity is the speed of light. That's a zippy 300,000 kilometers per second. So if anything with, this, with, with that kind of um, uh, escape velocity is a black hole, right? And if, according to Einstein's theory of special relativity, nothing travels faster than light. So if light itself isn't speedy enough to escape, then neither is anything else. And so the object becomes inescapable, like a bottomless hole from which there's no return. And also, if light can't escape from it, then we can't see it, so it appears black, hence black hole. That's all there is to it. So, well, if you decide to fall into a black hole, I should say, uh, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. A gruesome death awaits you. For in, lying in wait at the heart of every black hole is a singularity, a place where, 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 the, where um, gravity becomes infinitely strong. As you approach close to the singularity, you will be painfully dismembered. So it's not a good way to go. So, well, oh, incidentally, black holes um, do not have to be very big. Uh, you can actually take any object and crush it down so that its, uh, its gravitational pull becomes, its escape velocity becomes that of the speed of light. So, for example, you could take the Earth and compress it until it became the size of a marble, and then it would be a black hole Earth. In nature, black holes are not formed this way. They are typically formed out of the uh, death state, or the, they're basically the corpses of very heavy stars, heavier than our sun. But in principle, in our labs, for example, we could create even microscopic black holes. You could take anything and compress it down, and you would get a black hole. Okay. All right, so uh, what about their shape? Oops. Yes, sir. So black holes can be either spinning or not spinning. And the not spinning ones all look like this. They are spheres. They are perfect spheres. They're the most spherical objects in the entire universe. They come in no other shape. They do. OK? So every black hole looks only like this. Now, uh, the only thing that can vary is the diameter of the sphere, which in turn depends on the mass, which you can think of as the weight, if you like. So um, imagine a nightmarish world where the only thing that defines you is your weight. And so that you would be indistinguishable, literally indistinguishable, from all those faceless others who have the same weight as you. That would be a society of black holes. All right, so what does this have to do with, uh, now I've given you a sense of what black holes are, so what does this have to do with the question I asked earlier about the predictability of physics? Well, consider what we know. We know that the only thing that characterizes this black hole is its mass. This leads us to an to think of an experiment. Imagine that we have this pink elephant that bravely, valiantly, in the name of science, leaps into the black hole. And then this green elephant that does the same thing. Now you'll see that after the elephants have fallen into the black hole, the black hole is still just a perfect sphere. Its mass it's, has increased by one elephant, but it's otherwise identical. So now we have a problem. We have two distinct pasts, one with an infalling pink elephant and one with an infalling green elephant, that seem to lead to the same final state of a black hole that has gained 
one elephant in mat. Fortunately, if we are to look inside the black holes, we would see that, uh, that they'd look different from inside. For, for example, either when there's a pink elephant falling in, you'd see that inside there's a pink elephant. And similarly, when you have a green elephant, you'd find that inside the black hole, there's a green elephant. So here, uh, again, there's no problem. There's a, one, there's a match between, future, between past and future that, in which distinct pasts correspond to distinct futures. But all this changed in 1974. In 1974, Stephen Hawking made a sensational discovery, a discovery that rocked the world of physics to its very foundation. What Hawking found was that there was, in fact, a way to get out of black holes. Now, we've already said that nothing can get out of black holes because you'd have to travel faster than the speed of light in order to do so, and nothing can travel faster than light. Hawking had not found a way to travel faster than light. Instead, he exploited the freakish laws of quantum mechanics to, uh, to predict that black holes would, in fact, be emitting particles. So let me give you an idea of how quantum mechanics would lead to the disintegration of black holes. So how does that work? Well, there's an, old, uh, there's an old Woody Allen film called Deconstructing Harry, in which there's a character who finds himself to, out of focus. And not just out of focus on film, but just out of focus, actually out of focus in real life. He's, of course, very concerned about this. Um, what quantum mechanics says is that we are all actually like that. We are all slightly out of focus. We're all a little bit blurry. And in particular, that means that we cannot really, you cannot really say where your position is with complete certainty. There's a, there's a little bit of uncertainty, a slight haziness to where you are exactly. So, for example, it's highly likely that you are sitting in your seat. But there is a small chance that you are actually sitting in the adjacent seat. And there's an even smaller chance that you are not in this room at all. And a still minute, more minute probability that right now, at this moment, you are on the moon. That's what quantum mechanics says. Now, that's what permits um, well, let me. So, for example, uh, here we have a house, and uh, here is the probability of distribution of the location of this woman here. And you can see that most likely she's inside a room, as she thinks she is. But there is a small chance denoted here by the tail of this curve that she's, in fact, outside her house. Now, that leads to a phenomenon called tunneling, by which objects can pass through walls by just spontaneously materializing outside. There's a chance she's here, but suddenly you could find her right here. So says quantum mechanics. Now, some of you may have noticed from past experience that you don't usually walk through walls. And that's true. Uh, on macroscopic scales, for human beings, the odds of doing that are so tiny that you are unlikely, that's unlikely to ever happen to you even during the entire lifetime of the universe. That's not likely to happen to you even once that you would go through even the most paper-thin wall. But smaller particles tunnel all the time. And in work that I did with my doctoral advisor, I found that Hawking radiation, those escaping particles that Hawking predicted, are actually a stream of particles that tunnel out of the black hole. So what happens is these particles use their intrinsic blurriness, 
these particles use their intrinsic blurriness to pop up spontaneously on the outside of black holes. So they could be just inside, but then they could have materialized just outside. Uh, so, well, uh, this is a, so as a result, black holes leak a steady stream of particles. Uh, and as, the, as this mist of particles escapes, the black hole loses energy and therefore mass by E equals mc squared and eventually disappears. So the black holes can actually evaporate in a mist of particles. So far from being these ever growing, ever fattening brutes, they are actually, uh, you know, if they don't get uh, love and care, they will evaporate in a puff of Hawking radiation. So um, this was surprising enough, but Hawking found something else, something deeply disturbing. He found that the outgoing uh, radiation, the outgoing Hawking particles, do not carry any information about what was inside the black hole. They're featureless. And that's terrible, because that means that whatever information that was inside the black hole will be lost once the black hole evaporates. And as we saw, the lack, the preservation of information, the unique, the unique matching of past and future is essential to physics. For 40 years, physicists have wrestled with this problem. For some have searched for signs in the Hawking radiation for little subtle clues, subtle information about what was in there, in the Hawking, what was the content of the black hole. And they have found nothing so far. Others have resigned themselves to accept that black holes destroy the link between past and future. String theory, our best theory of uh, quantum gravity, gives indirect evidence that black holes do preserve information. Uh, but how they do so, we don't know. So, um, well, this is a mystery that is yet unsolved, and I hope that perhaps somebody here will be inspired to solve it one. Thank you.